How many Southerners do we have here in the building? No, 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 hold on. I'm not talking about like Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, South Carolina. No, I'm talking about the real South. The southernmost of the states. How many Floridians in the building? All right, a couple. <laughs> Most people argue that Florida isn't really even the South because it's mostly just a bunch of what we call as uh, Floridian snowbirds who come down and uh, drive really, really slowly and really, really poorly. Um, as a Florida native living in the Tampa area most of my life, going to places like Orlando for Disney World and Miami to visit family, there's one thing I know about Florida. There's not much change. Things tend to stay the same. See, Florida is a really, really flat area. Um, if anyone else, if anyone's been down there, I, I imagine a lot of you have for vacation and stuff, but um, my family had a topographical globe growing up. And so you could run your hand along it, including through the oceans, and feel where the mountain ranges were, and it would kind of raise and lower. So when you uh, came to the United States, you run your hand through like Colorado and Montana and feel the mountains, and then even through like Tennessee and North Carolina, where the uh, Appalachian Mountains are. But as soon as you ran your finger down along to Florida, flat, nothing. The climate in Florida, while it does rain, is mostly just sunny and humid. Every afternoon around 4 p.m., if you've spent any amount of time in the summer in Florida, you know this, every afternoon around 4 p.m. or so, we get a torrential downpour for about a minute, and then it's just back to being sunny and unbearably humid. But I know what you're thinking, Matt, what about the change of seasons? Well, let's look at some temperatures real quick. In 2016, the, uh, in St. Petersburg, my hometown, the average temperature during the summer was 92. Now, that doesn't sound that bad. That includes, you know, the night and everything. But let's keep in mind that the average humidity was 88%, with it being up to 100 most days. All right, now let's look at the averages during another time. Right in the middle of winter, let's look at the averages on Christmas Day. 2016, the high on Christmas Day was, anyone want to guess? 81. And you think, okay, that's just a one-time thing. You know, it was warm last year. All right, uh, high on Christmas 2015, 82. 2014, it wasn't terrible. It was 69. 2013, it was 73. And in 2012, it was 71. See, there's not much difference. There's not much change in temperature. Most people go down to Florida. They're not looking for some mountain to climb or, or a big obstacle to face. People go down to Florida to vacation or to retire. People don't move to Florida when they're looking for some big transformation in their lives. They move down to Florida to have a good time and take it easy. There's one thing, though, that causes big change in Florida. One thing. Anyone want to guess? Hurricane, you got it. Most of you might think, well, that's a bad change, you know, hurricane destruction. But if it's a tropical storm or a mild hurricane, that is the best time to be a Floridian. The, when a hurricane comes to town, the air it gets cooler. There's a nice breeze. Kids get let out of school. We didn't have snow days in Florida. We have hurricane days. <laughs> the waves get taller, good for surfing. It's great great to be on the beach. And if it rains enough, which a lot of times it does, people will take their boats out into the streets. And even during severe hurricanes, there, there's some negative change, but there is some positive change because it really brings the groups in Florida together. We help each other rebuild. See, there's a few things like that in our lives, right? Maybe you're starting a new job, you're, you're starting school, maybe you're just getting married or you're retiring, and there's this big change that's going to happen. As Christians, one of the primary, most foundational things that will actively transform and transfigure our lives is the Word of God. So in continuing in our study of Hebrews and our Greater Than series, we're going to be looking at Hebrews 12 and, and what the Word of God can do in our lives. So we're going to be looking at the verse we talked about at the beginning of service. So grab your Bible, go to Hebrews 4, and that's going to be 12 and 13. And we're going to be there the whole service so you can stay there. Hebrews 12, or Hebrews 4 rather, verses 12 through 13 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation 
is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. A lot of you have probably seen this verse. Maybe you've seen it at like Lifeway or family Christian bookstores. And it's like maybe on a plaque or a t-shirt. And you see this knight holding a sword, you know, kind of riding a, riding a, a horse or something. What the author is saying here is something really, really powerful, though. What the author is saying in this verse is that the Word of God has the power to transform lives. See, Scripture shows us that God's Word is alive and active in our lives. It digs deep, convicting and reconstructing us, and ultimately it's exposing and will lay bare who we are as individuals. But sometimes, even though the Word of God has such immense power, it's easy to go through the motions while reading Scripture, right? Sometimes when we read Scripture in church or or in our personal lives with our families, we might simply read it and and go back and be like, yeah, mm -hmm, that's real good. I know sometimes growing up when I was sitting in church and the preacher would read through a, a, a verse, I'd be like, Yep, I've heard that a million times. And it's, it's easy to just look at that and not think of anything of it. It's sometimes when I'm like reading, especially this happens when I read comic books. Yes, I read comic books. Um, I'll, I'll read through a panel and I won't really look at the artwork. And, and what, what's happening in that panel and what the, the character is saying won't really sink in. I'll have to go back and really, really read it and really, really pay attention. And I think it's easy to do that with scripture sometimes. But when we do that, we miss out on the transformative properties that exist within Scripture. So what exactly is the Hebrew author saying in this particular verse? Well, the first thing he says that is the Word of God is alive. Go ahead and throw that slide up for me. The Word of God is alive. So go back to verse 12 real quick. In the first first sentence in verse 12, the author says, For the Word of God is alive and active. The Word of God is alive, and because of this, it is active in our lives. Occasionally, I'll hear from people, what does the Bible have to do with me? You know, it's written thousands of years ago by a bunch of guys. What does it have anything to do with me in the 21st century in my life? So let's go back and take a look at the scripture that most everyone knows. No, it's not John 3.16. This is a scripture that a lot of people know, and it's not only in our scriptures, but in the scripture of the Jewish people, the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments first found in the book of Exodus, which was, uh, they were given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. Um, it's traditionally to have been, uh, thought, thought to have been written in 1400 BC. For you, those of you bad at math, that's about 3,400 years ago. Is the word of God alive and active in our lives? Well, let's take a look at some of the oldest scripture ever recorded. Anyone know the first commandment? I hear a lot of, you shall have no other gods before me. That's pretty straightforward, right? Don't put anything above God. Nothing. Not TV, not relationships, not work, not sports, parents. Um, Don't put anything above God. Worship God and God alone. You should not make any idols or graven images. Don't confine God to anything. Don't say, hey, this communion table is God. Let's worship that. God is all-powerful and all-knowing, exists everywhere. Don't confine him. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't use God's name as a swear word. He's the creator of the universe. How would you feel if I was like, man, that guy's being a real Tom Pottle? (laughs) God is the creator of the universe, the all-powerful all-knowing God. Don't use his name poorly. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Last week, Tim talked about the Sabbath. Take time to rest and to worship. Don't constantly go. Honor your father and mother. My parents loved this one growing up. Man, who? If you're still blessed to have your parents alive, respect them. They did bring you into this world after all. Now, this one's really tough and it's it's really hard to equate it to our, our lives today. Um, you shall not murder. That was a joke. You're supposed to laugh. Uh, clearly, you're not supposed to murder people. Don't kill people. You should not commit adultery. Don't cheat on your spouse, emotionally or physically. Be faithful. You shall not steal. Don't take stuff that isn't yours. You should not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's just fancy talk for don't lie. 
shall not covet. Don't become jealous of what other people have. Be content in your life. You see, a lot of these, all of these apply to us today. And while maybe not every verse in scripture can apply directly exactly to how we are in our lives in the 21st century because I think it's kind of hard to feel how it feels to have a thousand pagans rushing into your city walls or to face a nine foot tall giant with a sling. All of these themes, all of these ideas can be conveyed and can be used in our lives. The word of God is alive And it is constantly active when we read it and allow ourselves to be open to what it has to say. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And there is scripture all over the place that applies to our lives. Throughout the Psalms, we see the authors asking God for confidence, for for hope, crying out to him during difficult times. First and second Timothy, Paul talks, gives encouragement to Christians living in an ungodly world. In the gospels, we see the teaching of Christ and how he brought the new covenant and hope of salvation to us. See, the word of God is still alive. And because it is still alive to this day, thousands of years after it was written, it still has the power to transform lives. Secondly, the author of Hebrews conveys the power of the word of God and what it can do. Go back to verse 12 and we're going to read the second half of that. Verse 12 states that the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I'm not going to lie, I had a rough time synthesizing what this part was saying, finding a word or phrase that really, really encompassed everything. Ultimately, I came to the conclusion that the word of God is reconstructive. It came down to two phrases. It came down to reconstructive or deconstructive. And I believe that both are correct. I I think that God's word can deconstruct us. Just as this verse says, it it penetrates us, it, it, it digs into us, into our soul and spirit, and it judges us. So I believe that the word of God is deconstructive, but ultimately the deconstructive of ourselves is so that God's word can reconstruct us, so we can more imitate Christ. God's word reconstructs our lives, changing us from the very core of our beings, piercing our very selves and reworking us, reconstructing us. This is the power of Scripture. So I know everyone has a, everyone kind of has different hobbies, different things they like to do. I, I was always really interested in theology. Um, I know people who like to work on muscle cars, um, people who like to collect old coins. Um, I knew a guy who spent a lot of time uh, his free time working on model airplanes, and I'm like, just buy the airplane, put together what just. So you can look at it. It's like that ruins the fun. All hobbies have their merit, but I think some are dumb. Anyway, I have a hobby that I think is way cooler than all of those. Maybe a little less conventional. Um, I'm a collector of edged weapons. Um, This is a modernized version of a Gladius. uh, Which would have been used during Roman times with a shield called a scotum. Now, this is a high carbon steel sharpened replica, so do not come up here and play night with this because it will injure you. <laughs> you might have seen uh, Russell Crowe use one in the movie Gladiator. Um, I have a picture of that. You want to put that up? Or uh, if you're, shall we say, more seasoned, seeing Kirk Douglas use one in the movie Spartacus um, back in the 60s. The sword was used from the 3rd century BC to the 4th century AD in the Roman Empire. So that means this would have been the sword used when Jesus was alive. And also the sword that would have been used when the book of Hebrews was written. As a double-edged sword, it has a lot of capabilities. So because of how wide the blade is, how thick it was, it would have been great for slashing. It would really dig into the targets because of the forward heavy weight it has. But because of the spear point and tip, because of how stout the blade is, it would have been excellent for piercing. It would have been able to pierce through the toughest of armor at that time. 
And you see, that's what scripture does. Regardless of the armor we've built up, regardless of anything, when we clear our minds and allow God to work through it, scripture is more powerful than the sword or, or, or any weapon you can imagine. It digs into us and it, it, it pierces us and it, and it convicts us for how Christ desires us to live. Well, it may be deconstructing. Ultimately, the goal of the word of God is to reconstruct us to more resemble the life of Christ. So when you're reading scripture, you sit down to do your devotion or, or you're trying to maybe prove a person wrong theologically. Don't forget that the word of God has an immense power. When we truly read and hear the word of God, we open up the possibility to transform our lives. Ephesians six thirteen through 17 says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I forget how I was going to place this. Lay it on top. That's right. And lastly, we see that the word of God is exposing. See, this is the start where the part where start to feel a little, little bit uncomfortable. Go back to chapter four. Look at verse thirteen. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. See, we worship a God who is omniscient. He, he knows all things. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. And he's omnipresent. He can exist all places at once. Just as this verse says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. And eventually, we all will have to give an account for what we do. Now, this is the scary part. Because sometimes I think back and I go, I have to give an account for that. Now, I don't know how that account will go. Tim and I kind of talked about it recently. Maybe it's going to be like Judge Judy style and says, Judge Jesus. And we're sitting and he's sitting with the gavel listing off what we've done. I have a feeling it'll closer be, uh, closer, be closer to us kind of understanding what we've done. And then if we accepted Christ to, to have the knowledge that we are forgiven of every single thing because of the blood of Christ. See, the word of God is exposing because it shows us what is right and wrong. It speaks about how we're supposed to treat others. It tells us to be selfless, to love one another, to follow Christ no matter what, to defend those who can't defend themselves. Scripture is exposing because it tells us that we are not only guilty of the sins of commission where we do something wrong, but guilty of sins of omission where we don't do what we know is right. Similar to cutting into our soul, it exposes who we are as people. And we will all have to give an account of every single thing we've done. Everything we do, everything we say, our actions, according to scripture, are known by God. So let's transform our lives. Let's transform ourselves so the things that we give an account for, we can be proud of. Scripture exposes us for who we are. So if you're not happy with who you are, allow God to work in you through his word. Allow him to live in you through the active teaching of his word. Read it, memorize it, and study it. See how it applies to your life today. Allow it to pierce your heart and bite into you, convicting you and reconstructing you. And let it expose you. Let it, it expose all your flaws and your failures and all your greatest traits as well so that you can come to the forefront as an open and honest believer of Christ. Scripture is so powerful. And, and I grew up in the church since I was younger. Um, and it was easy to kind of read it and think nothing of it. And I think maybe some of you have experienced that as well. And then going to Bible college... Um, it's, it gets a little bit different. It's not just read it and don't think anything of it. It's scripture as a textbook because I have to memorize, you know, 
20 verses and I have to remember how to spell all these names that are ridiculous and do all these things. And I'm sure Tim and Ben and whoever went to Bible college as well can kind of relate to that. Slowly in the past few years, though, God has really warmed my heart to be accepting towards Scripture, to convict me and to show me His way. So I encourage you, if, you, if you're going through the motions of just reading Scripture this morning, if, if all you do is read it on Wednesday and Sunday, stay in His Word. Warm your heart to it. Because the power of God, the Word of God, has the power to transform your life. King Josiah is known as one of the few good kings of Israel. If you go back and read through the Old Testament, you see a lot of bad kings. They did a lot of bad stuff. He started his reign when he was eight years old. Yep, eight years old, reigning a, reigning a, er, re, governing over a kingdom. He reigned for 30 years. In the, in the 18th year of his reign, when he was 26, uh, he had a, people, uh, a group of people go to work on the temple of the Lord. The instruction that was given about the temple of the Lord was really specific, so it had to be honored fully. And Hilkiah was one of King Josiah's high priests. And when the work was being done on the temple, the book of the law was found. It was somewhat hidden and abandoned. It hadn't been read in a long time. It was found in the temple, and this would have been the Torah, of the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. 2 Kings 22, 8-13 says, Hokiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan who read it. Then Shaphan the secretary went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid, the, paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. And then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hokiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave the orders to Hilkiah the priest, Achaim, son of Shaphan, Abkor, son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Isaiah, the king's attendant, go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people of all of Judah, that is Israel, about what is written in the book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. You see, after this, King Josiah becomes one of the only kings in all of Israel known as good. Because he led the people of Israel towards God in his reign. You see, even thousands of years ago, in scripture itself, scripture, the word of God is changing people's lives. It's cutting into their hearts. It's, it's digging into who they are. And King Josiah felt that conviction to lead Israel So as we go throughout our lives this week, after you leave this place to allow God's word to, to transform our lives. If you're not staying in God's word, if it's something you only read occasionally when you're in church, I encourage you to start reading. Read through the Gospels about the life of Christ and the death and resurrection of Jesus. Read through Psalms or Proverbs for, for wisdom or for understanding people coming from places of hurt. Maybe read through the epistles about things after the life of Christ, how we're united in Him through his blood. The word of God is is alive, it's reconstructive, and it's exposing. And ultimately, it has the power to transform every one of us. Let's pray. Dear God, I pray that as we come to you this morning, we would open our hearts, we would open our minds, and they would be open to your word. They would be open to what you have to say. God, I pray if we have hardened our hearts, if we have not allowed you in, let's not do it one more day. Let us open ourselves to your word. Help us stay in it every day to find better what we can do to serve and honor you. Thank you for your son and the blessings that he has allowed us and afforded us. In your name, amen. God wants to transform us. He does that through His Word. He does that through coming together and worshiping. And so the next few minutes is all going to be about transformation. 
It's going to be about what does God want to do in your life. So we we got several songs that we're going to sing. And throughout this time of worship, it's a time for you to think about your transformation. Are you transforming, allowing God to transform you into the person He wants you to be? So you might need to make a decision to accept Jesus for the first time. That's where transformation truly begins. Or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but you, you just you don't get into God's Word. You're not serious about your faith. You need God to, to transform you again so that you're in a good relationship with Him. Uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to come around the Lord's table to where you can uh, take communion. The bread represents Jesus' body. The juice represents Jesus' blood. And we have a station in the middle on each side. We have four in the back. And you can go and you can take the communion right there.